Great, thank you. So it is uh, my honor to be interviewing uh, Simone Stumpf, who is a senior lecturer at City University of London. Um, she has a, an illustrious career studying things ranging from biometric security to end user programming to intelligent user interfaces. But uh, most especially important for us today, um, we're going to be talking about her work in explanations in ML, a subject which has barely come up. Um, <laughs> So I, I want to start out and ask you this. Uh, I feel like you were fairly early uh, to this field, and I'm curious, um, what was your motivation for studying explanations in the context of ML? Um, thanks, Martin. Great question. Um, I was actually asked that same question um, last week while driving to Frankfurt Airport and tra being trapped in a car. Um, and um, it was back... I think in 2005, I was working in the States on, on a small project called Kalo, um, out of which Siri came. Um, unfortunately, I was not in that team. Um, so I was working uh, in a team that looked at um, task recognition um, on, on desktop computers and um, resource prediction of what you might need for a particular task. And it, the accuracy was atrocious. Um, so um, we, we sort of started out kind of going, well, why is this, right? Why is it so bad? And oh, wouldn't it be great if we could explain to the computer um, what was actually going wrong, right? Um, so actually, we cast this as a debugging problem, right? Um, so how can we correct the, the systems, the machine learning mistakes? And then we quickly realized that actually the, the explanation from the machine learning was just a means to an end to, to get people to articulate how a machine learning could be approved. So there's sort of a two-way a two loop there. Uh, yeah, two -way so communication. explain from, from the machine and explaining back. And so do you see now is do you think debugging is the only purpose for an explanation, or do you see other purposes? Oh, I think there's, there's many different purposes, and I think that that is so important to bear in mind, because I think many people um, just uh, cast it in a, in a sort of term of, um, oh, we need explanation for any system all the time so people can understand what's going on. And clearly, that, that is not the case. I think people... Um, well, companies might just go, I want an explanation so people trust my system more, right? Uh, that has nothing to do with better understanding on, on part of the, the user. And what are, do you think the same kinds of explanations work for everyone? Or, you know, we're guessing not, it's probably more complicated than that. Can you talk a little bit about what sort of explanations are best for what sort of user? Um, I think that that is a really interesting question because I think up to quite recently, um, there was that misconception that an explanation is, um, a particular type of explanation is good for everyone. Um, but I think um, explanation need to be um, targeted at some, someone. So it's, it's an essentially human thing and, and also targeted at particular user groups. So, you know, an explanation to, say, a machine learning developer who wants to understand what the system is doing more and, and perhaps improve it needs to be different to perhaps an end user or a regulator or, you know, a domain expert. So you have to craft these explanations for different user groups. One of the things that struck me in, in reading some of your papers is uh, the idea that, you know, machines are, of course, fallible, but so are humans. Um, and I, I think there's a paper of yours that had to title something along the lines of stop fiddling um, <laughs> with this thing. Can you tell us a little bit about um, overconfident humans? Um, yeah, so we, um, uh, there's a particular study that we did actually with um, uh, uh, medical professionals. Um, so... Uh, it was in the domain of balance disorders. Um, so we had domain experts that were developing um, uh, these models, and then the idea was to, to roll this clinical decision support systems out to 
um, perhaps GPs or, or you know, um, people who were not expert in, in balance disorders. And so what we did, we, um, we did a, a, a user study and presented them with, um, with diagnoses um, based on, you know, some vignettes. Um, uh, we carefully manipulated them to be sometimes wrong. Um, and um, also we presented different um, explanations, so uh, different depths of explanations. And what we found was that um, if you provided more explanation, um, then people were more likely to agree with, with the diagnosis that the system gave. Um, and um, uh, what was fascinating was that um, people who were not very confident in their abilities um, uh, agreed more. Um, and then people who were very sure of their abilities uh, tended to disagree um, with, with the machine, even though they probably shouldn't have. So the um, confidence didn't correlate with their competence, you're saying? No, and um, I think, you know, there has been some um, recent emphasis on, on the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, uh, and I don't know if, if everybody's familiar with the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, show your hands if you are not. Okay, so um, the Dunning-Kruger effect is, is basically this model that the, the more confident um, uh, you are in your abilities, the, the more mistakes you actually make. So you're, you're kind of misinterpreting uh, a lot of um, uh, decisions and, and perhaps going against sort of machine learning advice. Um, it's often called uh, the mountain of stupid. So it sounds like there are some individual differences in what kind of explanation is useful, as well as uh, situational differences. Do you think uh, there is hope for explanations that take into account a model of the human user? Um, I think, you know, um, it, it's kind of, in, in HCI, you would, you would so, sort of go, oh, that's the holy grail, user modeling. All we have to do is, is just model the user, and then we can uh, just craft um, appropriate explanation for everyone. Um, I think there is something to that. Um, you know, it's very in intriguing to think that you could leverage machine learning to personalize the explanation of a machine learning system. A um, bit meta, but you know that that is good. But until I think we get there and have that amount of data that um, uh, that is necessary for that, I think we're just back to good old UX and HCI work of human-centered design. It's good to know, actually, the old methods are not suddenly obsolete. Um, I, I want to ask you your thoughts on some of the many uh, metaphors or descriptions of explanations that we've heard today, which I think range from, you know, critiques that, uh, you know, an explanation needs to take into account an entire socio-technical system to a big picture of a black box that basically says, don't panic over this. It's, it's fine. Uh, how do you view explanations? Or, or do you, you know, when you listen to these other uh, versions of how we should think about them, what is your reaction? Um, so I'm fairly inclusive of what I would call an explanation. Um, so I think, um, uh, to my mind, an explanation is something that answers a question by a user, right? Um, and so that could be through uh, a data visualization, right? Um, if that, those are answering a question that the user has, then that, that is fine. It could be just, uh, I think I talked to somebody earlier, it could be a traffic light. <laughs> um, traffic light as explanation? Yeah, sort of a traffic light system of, you know, how confident are you? Um, you know, it, it could be a, a textual explanation. Um, I think, you know, whatever works. I think also we, we could think about completely different mediums of, of explaining different things. I think I'm becoming more um, uh, comfortable with using intelligibility instead of explainability um, of a system. What would be an example of that? Um, so I think um, 
some of the, actually it's in your guidebook, guidebook and, and the mental models. So if you if you're in the domain of mental models, you know that human build humans build mental models all the time, right? Um, they improve it, they refine it, they might get it wrong, um, and um, so actually um, you can. Um, a system can become intelligible not just through an explanation, through explicit means, but also through interaction with it, right? Um, and so I see actually explanation more as a, as a boost in intelligibility um, rather than the only way that we can make something understandable and, and usable to, uh, to human beings. So as you've done experiments, because as you say, you're working in a very human-centered way, what is the most surprising user behavior you've seen uh, regarding explanations? <laughs> um, Anything that shocked you? Um, I'm not too sure if anything has shocked me in terms of, um, uh, well, has anything shocked me in, in terms of ex explanations? I think what has shocked me in terms of responding to explanations is, uh, so I've, I've worked in interactive machine learning um, uh, quite a bit, where we take um, essentially feedback from, from the user back from the explanation into the, the machine learning system. And, and what surprised me is that um, how how wrong people can make the machine learning system based on, on, on their feedback. So uh, usually what we see is uh, overall, right, taking across all user and all of the feedback, um, we improve system accuracy, except for some users, which again, you know, provide so really wrong feedback. Describe a system or what, what the user does that makes things go so wrong? Um, so, um, actually, we, we did a study on, on that where, where we were trying out how we can uh, incorporate user feedback um, back into the machine learning system, and um, uh, we did that on a, um, a text classifier. Um, and what we found was that users um, choose, they're, they, they're using semantics, right? Um, so, uh, if you actually uh, look at um, what words they pick um, in terms of, um, you know, perhaps increasing um, the weight, um, you you quickly find that that they are that they're using common sense concepts, right? They're finding relations in this. Actually, that comes back to to one of the previous talks, right? It's it's the relationships that people pay attention to. That's interesting. And is this something where you find individual differences? Some people are actually able to give feedback well, or is this something that's more we just haven't figured out, um, or we don't have the literacy to, to give feedback? Um, uh, I think that's up to, uh, to, de to debate, because I don't think we, we know enough yet about why people give good feedback and, and some other people don't. Um, uh, people have sort of speculated that, you know, oh, if you're good at maths, then you might give better feedback because you understand, you know, the reasonings of machine learning better. Um, uh, so we don't know. Um, and I think that is also, again, where we might want to think about, well, could we pick out these people that give bad feedback or not so good feedback and, and stop incorporating their their, their, you know, explanations back to the system. It's very interesting because that ties directly back into how we started this idea that explanations really are two way and that, you know, there's the issue of how you get the machine to explain itself to the human and the human to the machine. Um, one thing I do want to do is give the audience an opportunity to ask you questions. Um, if, yeah, we can certainly keep talking, but it occurs to me that um, some people may have questions for Simone. And if anyone does, we have a microphone. Um, ah, I see someone walking over. Ah, it's my, my shirt double. <laughs> <laughs> I just Look at I, that. I, I couldn't avoid it. <laughs> so I'm sort of curious when we get into these explanations, and particularly in this lens of common sense, which you know I, I found is 
it's pretty uncommon, right? So one example I wanted to sort of talk through is I landed today at the airport and I needed to get to this conference. So I go on Google Maps and I'm like, I need to get to this conference. And it tells me how long it would take precisely to get there. But it doesn't sort of say, hey, like the train's probably not going to show up at this time, et cetera, et cetera. So when you're dealing with explanations and thinking about the definition of AI, which is like, do what I mean, not what I say, like not necessarily tell me exactly the transit time, but tell me how long it will take me literally to get into this building. Have, can you talk about maybe some experiences you've had designing products like that? Um, so the, the way that I would approach it at the, at the moment, because we, we, we are lacking um, design principles, um, design guidelines, or even design patterns for, for these things. Um, it's, it's really back to handcrafting a lot of them, which I find incredibly frustrating, right? Because um, you want to work at scale, right? You want to go, oh, you know, let's work for this problem. Let's, let's just use the same thing over here. Um, uh, so really it is at the moment that, that you have to go in and you have to do user research and you have to work with the machine learning people and you have to literally go, oh, let's stick something like that over here and, and include those explanations and see if it works and do user studies. So at, at the moment we're stuck at that and I hope that in the next few years we, we get to you know, actually building good UX of AI. Oh, yeah, thanks for that. So a um, question that might sort of link you and Matt, the, 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 the previous panel. Something about, you, you were talking about intelligibility instead of explanation in some way. And I feel like there's a whole sort of missed opportunity here somewhere for much more embodied sorts of interfaces that kind of maybe require less explanation and just deliver more of that intelligibility and the kind of, you know, point at the light bulb thing seems to be in that ballpark and also the vending machine with its sheer physicality. So I wonder if you could say a bit more about what you had in mind by intelligibility and see if they hook up somehow. Um, yes, in a way, you're exactly right. I think using intelligibility opens the way to other mediums of communicating with the user yeah. uh, that is not just cast in terms of an explanation of what people might um, understand with it. So, you know, you, you could say, well, it could be embodied, it could be haptic, it could be just through yeah. continued exposure to, to a process of, of prediction that makes it understandable, intelligible. Um, it also means that... Um, I think we are then talking about different metrics and measurements of what it means to be intelligible. Um, so explanation, usually you go, okay, has it in, you know, um, what's the mental model like now? Have you increased understanding? Um, whereas intelligibility also includes, well, are you using it appropriately? Right? So, yeah. Thank you. Actually, I guess just quick follow-up on that. So, so there's a sense in which maybe we end up being more intimate with these intelligible technologies, but that pushes explanation away again a bit, doesn't it? It's sort of like, so do you think there's a cost of going in that direction, a cost where you just, you're cosy with it, and so it's not, maybe, maybe there's a degree of coziness we, we don't want. I just suddenly started to worry about that. Um, yeah, so um, I feel a little bit like I'm biting the hand that feeds me because <laughs> I'm kind of going, explanations don't matter. <laughs> um, but I, I always think that um, explanations are means to an end. Um, and it's always important to, to think about, well, what's the end? What do you want to achieve with it? Um, and that can be different in different circumstances. Terrific. That's a great point to end at because it's a beautiful summing up and our time is up. So thank you very much.